we're ready. Okay. <clears throat> well, I want to say welcome again to Pittsburgh. You've been here um, many times. Yeah. How's the family? They're fine. They're fine. Everybody. Please give uh, my regards to your wife, Amina. Okay. Uh, when you get back uh, home. You know, I served on Pittsburgh City Council for um, 11 years. Yeah, I know. And we were just talking about uh, little Ross Joy, who's not so little. Ross <laughs> 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 Joy, <Joe>, old. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore, your son, who uh, is a both a public school principal and was deputy mayor in Newark and now uh, has recently been re-elected to um, city council. I know you must be proud of Ross. Yeah, um, very much so. Tell us about a little bit about Ross's uh, entry into the politics of Newark, how it was an extension of the politics of uh, um, that we started way back. Yeah, well, even when uh, we were in an organization together. We used, to, we used to take them to places, you know, all these political things, including my son, Ahi, who was very little at the time. Is that Ahi? <laughs> <laughs> See, so we, we always carried them with us everywhere, yes, right. and all those rallies and stuff. And, uh, you know, Raz just apparently was drawn to that you know, and uh, picked it up. He, mm -hmm. he, he was, he and also the other son, Amiti mm -hmm. Jr., mm -hmm. they were into some political organization when they were in uh, high school. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, they organized all the students to walk out of the schools because there was no black studies. Right. See, so it was, uh, you know, it was a long, it was a long journey actually to uh, where he finally got to be the deputy mayor with under Sharp James for four years with a dollar for a dollar a year. Yeah. Now they paying the deputy mayor is one hundred and seventy six thousand dollars a year. <laughs> he was a little late, <laughs> a little early. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is another kind of uh, regime that we have yeah. now. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's you know it's been a long time coming. Then when he when Raz went to Howard, uh, they shut down the school about this. Uh, what was this man's name? A uh, Bush appointee mm -hmm. who they were going to put on the board of trustees of Howard. Right. And so they shut the school down. You right. know. And uh, I went down there, and uh, the mayor. Pick me up, you know. Uh, the brother who was in SNCC, who's the mayor, he's still city councilman down yes. there. Uh, they took me to to directly to the school, and uh, the president of the town was so backward. He had called in the SWATs. <laughs> called and, SWATs on the mayor. <laughs> no, he called on SWATs on them students. The students yeah. had locked up the administration there. Yes. You know, what they did is uh, they went in there, then they pulled the, the, the fire alarm. Everybody right. ran out, then they locked the right. doors. Right, right. So he called a SWAT on them. So I got on the, the phone and called the people I knew who had children. Mm hmm Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and it was... Mm -hmm. Quite a few well-known, you know, yes. black people who have children. I said, right. you know, they're getting ready to do something to your kids. Yeah. And he, uh, he backed off that, you know, after a couple of days. They was in there a couple of days. <laughs> That's similar to the um, struggle we had at the University of Pittsburgh here, where we took over the computer center in the Cathedral of Learning and locked ourselves into the cathedral at that time computers were as big as refrigerators oh yeah yeah oh yeah yeah that's right yeah right <laughs> we had axes and hammers and were threatening to dismantle the computers and it changed their tune they became much more agreeable to have a conversation about black studies yeah no but that's what i don't think these students now realize how important that was to do that yes yes which yeah. is why I think that there's not 
as tight surveillance by the student body and the faculty over black studies right. as it gets diminished yeah, slowly. Sure. But what they did is after, you know, it's, things are always like this, after the militancy of, of really enforcing the initiation of this, then they start bringing in instructors right. who are not revolutionaries right. yeah. and who are simply faculty members who don't care what happens. Right. You know, that's what's right. happening all over the country. You know. And the whole initiation is forgotten. Yeah. They don't know how they got there. Mm -hmm. They have no they idea. They think that they're there because of their degrees and their brilliance. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and a lot of these Africans they bring in are, you know, just uh, content to be uh, some kind of administrative right. pawns, you yeah. know. But uh, yes. That comes from an era when we thought anything African was militant. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You know, we go back to a time um, when we brought a lot of young groups to Newark to see um, Spirit House. And um, of course, you've been widely known as the the father and founder of the black arts movement. I wonder how you would describe black arts um, today. What do you well, say? See, that was, remember, that was, uh, we had started, you know, organizing downtown in the village, you know, mm -hmm. trying to get some kind of black consciousness because that was, you know, the civil rights movement was unfolding. Right. But when Malcolm X got murdered, a lot of us, you know, young writers and painters and whatever, moved out of the village up into Harlem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had uh, I had a play downtown, so I was getting some kind of money. So we we then uh, rented a brownstone in Harlem and tore out the bottom floor. I don't know if the man knows today. <laughs> and you know, set up a theater, and yeah. then we began to send trucks out into the street, four trucks a night, every night, you know, with uh, music and dance mm -hmm. and poetry mm -hmm. and that. So uh, it had a very strong effect on the people because mm -hmm. we thought that if we were supposed to be doing such profound, you know, artistic things, that we need to bring that right into right into the neighborhood. Right. And what was interesting is the play Dutchman, my play Dutchman, which won Obie Award Best right. Off Broadway Play. When we brought it uptown, it became a racist play. Yeah. <laughs> How so? Well, because art in an abstract setting is one thing, mm -hmm. but art where you're actually telling people to do things <laughs> becomes dangerous, right. you know. That's, that's what, uh, that's what Jean Paul Sartre said. He said, uh, as long as you say that uh, something's wrong, but I don't know what, that's mm -hmm. art. When mm -hmm. you say something's wrong, then I know exactly who's doing it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's political protest. <laughs> so so we, had to, we had to work with that and under, begin to understand that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we wanted an art that was number one, identifiably Afro-American, mm -hmm. you know, according to our history and roots and so forth. Secondly, we, we wanted an art that was not contained in these small uh, venues. Mm -hmm. We wanted to come out and, and get into the street. That's why I was happy to see rap, because then you could hear people running stuff down, right. you know, out on in the street. street. And then mm -hmm. third, we wanted an art that would help in the liberation of black people. That was what art. Mm -hmm view was we didn't think that just writing a poem was sufficient right. that that poem if it had to have some kind of utilitarian use should help in liberating us mm -hmm. you know uh, so that's what we did we consciously uh, did that and we brought artists from all over you know the area uptown you know some of the great musicians at the time you know and uh, you know like you bring Sun Ra 
in the community and where people were saying Sunrise 2 are out for the people, the people thought it was dance music. <laughs> <laughs> they start dancing to it, you know, hey, but that's what it is. But uh, that, that was a, a new kind of, uh, and there's a picture, a picture on this book of mine, this new book of mine called Digging of the Front of the Black Arts. Mm -hmm. Just before we went out on the street, and it, I'm bringing this <laughs> wine in, and at the top of the steps is Sun Ra. So we were getting ready to go out into the street with that. So right. it, was, it, was, it was very effective. And uh, it, it, that particular trend spread across the country. The Black Arts Theaters opened in uh, uh, Milwaukee, uh, Chicago, uh, Atlanta. How do you see Black Art today? Well, we need to restore its purpose. You know, the thing, the thing that's disarming is the fact that if you've got an Afro-American presidential figure, and so that disarms a lot of people, mm -hmm. even though they still suffer from the same ills. Right. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I mean, the same way you see that the Tea Party people pop up, right. that after the Civil War, when the slaves thought they were free, then here come the Klan. It's the same thing. Right. You didn't need the Klan when slavery was going on, right. see? But the minute you say you're no longer a slave, then we get right. the Klan, then you get black code, you know? Yeah. So, so it's always a continuation of struggle. You cannot stop struggling because, you know, you've got a black guy walking around uh, saying some stuff. Uh, anybody who can bomb Libya, for instance, that should be the cue in your mind that just because his skin is your color don't mean his brain is the same as yours. You know, you're going to bomb Olivia, you're nuts. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a continuing, it's always a continuing struggle to raise the level of social consciousness in the country. Right. Not only for black people, but for everybody who needs that change. You know? Do you see black artists um, under the continued influence of black art to politicize their art. Some. But see, you've got a whole wave of people who are influenced by this sort of post-struggle art, mm -hmm. who, who believe that simply to write a poem about themselves is sufficient, you know, yes. or their family or something like that. That's not what it is. See, the whole question of, of, for instance, art, Shakespeare. If you look at Shakespeare, everything Shakespeare wrote was against the rulers in that particular age. You know, whether you looked at Julius Caesar, it was about the relationship between government and the people, you know, or the taming of the shrew, which is about uh, the oppression of women, you know what I mean? Or, or you know, Hamlet about the, you know, the development of liberalism and how liberalism, what should I do? Should I do this? Or should I do that? You know, you're not going to do nothing. You're going to get killed. <laughs> so, it's, so, so that, when you can understand that Shakespeare is about the elimination of that whole uh, aristocratic class in that period, uh, that all the things he talks about are things that we will have to deal with under capitalism. Mm -hmm for the rest of our lives, mm -hmm. you understand? But that's not the way it's presented. See, it's presented as some kind of a, a extra realistic, uh, you know, uh, mumbo jumbo in verse that puts people to sleep. And so they don't see the essence of what that is, yeah. you know? Yeah. But that's what an artist, to me, that's what artists are supposed to do is help to struggle for the advancement of, of human right. knowledge, right. you know? Right. There, there are, um, when we came to uh, Newark on many occasions, there were several Pittsburgh artists who were among us who were influenced by what they learned and experienced uh, at Spirit House. And they are, uh, they are revered here in Pittsburgh. Bob yeah, Penny one. Bob Penny, um, and I wanted to, name them and get you to reflect briefly uh, on their work, beginning August with Wilson. Rob Penny. <laughs> <laughs> and Rob Penny, I mean, uh, August Wilson, um, of course, uh, Ed Roberson, yeah. uh, poet, uh, John Edgar Wideman. Yeah. Start with Rob Penny. Um, 
Well, Bob actually was the most activist-oriented yeah. of them in terms of the literature. He actually wanted to do the things that we were talking about, to use the art to advance, you know, uh, black life, mm -hmm. a human consciousness. Uh, August, when I met August, August was a poet, right. and he was, we talked about poetry. I didn't know that he wrote, well, he didn't write the uh, plays then. He, Only later. Right? Yeah, he, he began to write right plays well. later. Yeah. And um, that's why he always made reference to me, because we were, he was a young poet, and you mm -hmm. know, talking to me about poetry. Uh, and I thought that was a, a, a miraculous kind of development. Mm -hmm. you know, I remember the first time his play came to New York, my wife and Toni Morrison went to see it. I was teaching Which at school. Rain? Yeah, I was teaching at Stony Brook, and I couldn't get there until after the play was over. They were telling me about, you know, about it. But um, he, August had a, a, a great influence on theater, mm -hmm. and I was, uh, see people don't know, August Wilson's evolution was important. He was, he wanted to know first why I wasn't a beatnik anymore, mm -hmm. you know, that was our, mm -hmm. next thing I knew about him, he had become a Muslim, you know, and joined the Nation of Islam, which he stayed for about that long. I think he and Sonia Sanchez got in the Nation of Islam about the same time and stayed for about the same time, right. 30 minutes. Right. <laughs> and then they were, you know, doing something else. Uh, Ed Robeson, I still know, he is, he worked at Rutgers so long. Yeah, you all were there around the same time? Right, we were yeah. there at the same time. I was, you know, teaching and he had an administrative kind of a job. Mm -hmm. But he was writing poetry. He's still writing poetry. And Daniel Mackey refers both to you as an early influence and to Ed Roberson. He talks about him and includes him in some of uh, his anthology work. Yeah, well, Ed's poetry is it's a very kind of fine, profound kind of poetry, you know, and it's interesting to me. Uh, John Edgar Whiteman, I, you know, we've had some some discussions that, <laughs> that I, I really don't want to credit them as his whole being, but we've had some, uh, I mean, we had a discussion about whether or not one should teach uh, the great, you know, icons of Afro-American literature. Mm -hmm. And my, my line is, you, you mean you wouldn't, you wouldn't teach uh, Fred Douglas? You wouldn't teach Du Bois? I don't understand that. Then he changed that because that's clearly impossible. If you're going to teach black studies, you have to teach the great people that came. Right. You know. Right. But those people, we had a, 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 a I think, a great kind of a learning from each other experience all together, mm -hmm. you know, all of those folks. And I, I was very proud, actually, that uh, of Rob and August how much they did do, mm -hmm. you know, and Rob came to Newark a couple of times, a few times, yes. yeah, yeah, or so on. Yeah. I was telling my son about when we were in the organization and we were having the second, uh, the second Gary convention, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we said, we sent Saladin down to, <laughs> down the Little Rock. To Little Rock. And the man kidnapped him. That's right. <laughs> man kidnapped him, boy. That was that was well, those were some wild and woolly days. That was scary. But yeah, well, I guess it was. I actually shot a bullet right past my head. It was that was scary. Well, I never understood what that Negro thought he was gonna get. He thought that when he was coming down here. He was money. taking over the bars and uh, the clubs, and he was just gonna make a bunch of money. Um, from the convention, from the convention, uh, we had had a a concert that we were going to be having, and um, he was trying to um, hijack the ticket sales <laughs> from the concert. He was a crazy person, man. I don't, I I wonder what I wonder what happened to him. I, I'm not. Uh, really concerned about it. <laughs> he could not have survived. 
<laughs> no, he's got to be dead. No, I know. By the time we got down there, man, it was been really so bad if we had seen it. You know. Yes. But I just thought that's like you talk about some nostalgia of a real turbulent yeah. 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 American life. Yeah. As we look at the evolution of that political uh, scene, um, come up to 2008, um, you put forward a compelling argument for progressives um, that the um, Barack Obama candidacy represented an opportunity for people to push forward the um, the uh, agenda for uh, democratic rights and uh, and equality, um, and now more recently, um, you describe Obama as a yapping Negro who would take us back to slavery. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder well, if you would sum up. Um, Barack's well, see, uh, presidency. The, the problem is the problem is this that I have to support Obama because I remember the Republicans. I remember George Bush, <laughs> and I see the ones they have lined up yes. over there now. You know, uh, but at the same time, he has to be criticized yes. for the stuff that he's done. I mean, you don't bomb. I mean, what are you going to get by bombing Africa? I mean, you know, to take the oil away from Gaddafi? And Gaddafi as a leader is no worse than the ones you're close friends with. Right. So what, where, where is the logic of that? And he has not learned to struggle with those people like I hoped he would. You know, there's no mm -hmm. way you're going to get anything done unless you're able to struggle with those uh Long time kind of lobbies, right. you know what I mean. Even when he was first elected, we sent ten thousand newspapers to Denver, saying President Obama, no bailout, nationalize the, <laughs> nationalize the insurance, nationalize the banks, nationalize the auto company, because, um, and you know, I, I had forums and stuff. We talked about that. I matter of fact, I talked to. A Harvard University, black Harvard University business majors. <laughs> and you know, talking to them about that was like futile. But I thought that it was the thing to do because it was an opportunity. Right. I mean, if you're running a business and you're making millions of dollars and then that business fails, why come to me yeah. who don't have no money? Yeah. Why should I give you my money to keep you rich <laughs> and I stay poor? That don't have to have any logic. There's no logic in that, you know. And so the only way I could justify that in my mind, why he did that, was that's his mindset. That he thought that above all, uh, capitalism, you know, not just petty capitalism, mm -hmm. but big time capitalism, Global. imperialism, yeah, has to survive. You know, monopoly had to survive for this country to survive. And, uh, all these people calling Obama socialists are just fools. Just, you know, they obviously don't know what socialism is. You know, but I still thought it was a respite. But so many times that he's been able to do things and then backed off, like that thing with Skip Gates about Skip getting busted. Right. He said it was stupid. That's that's sufficient. It was stupid. You know, except the heat. Right. You know, don't back off it. Yeah, it was, a, it was a stupid move. You're going to arrest the guy who's a Harvard University professor on his on own, own doorstep. Door. <laughs> now that's stupid. You know, and, 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 and obviously racist. Yeah. You know, but uh, to back away from that with some kind of uh, let's go drink beer together, that's just not sufficient, you know. Yeah. And, and that's what began to turn me to the other side of that, you know, said, well, I got to support him to the extent I can, but at the same time, I have to criticize him. Absolutely. You know. There's, there's, there's a, going to be another struggle. I mean, the, the Tea Party is lining up for 2012, um, and there's a lot more close scrutiny of Obama and um, critical support on the one hand when it can be supported, but criticism on the other hand where it needs to be criticized. <coughs> Going into the 2012 election, what should be the posture of progressives uh, relative to that election? 
Well, you know, the right is moving toward fascism. I don't, I don't care what they call it, you know. Uh, this whole business in Arizona, you know, the whole uh, trading uh, unemployment for, yeah. you know, refusing to tax the rich. Right. You know, in New Jersey, it's the same thing. He will not tax the rich, but we have all kind of budget cuts and things yeah. like that. That has to be fought. And uh, he has to be held up as a bulwark against that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what are we doing, mm -hmm. you know? But I think that it's important for us to fight the fringe, you know, the, the, the Tea Party, and to understand that a lot of the Republican and some Democrats, but a lot of the Republicans are nothing but the Klan in civilian clothes. They just took off those white robes, that's right. all. But they, always, they were all the way over there. And uh, like I said, the after the Civil War, didn't you get the Klan? See, you don't need the Klan while you got slavery. Right. So after Barack election, then you get the Tea Party. You know, it's the same thing. It's the Sisyphus syndrome. You know, you roll the rock, they don't roll it back down on right. your head. And uh, like I said last night, there was a guy named George Ramiro who predicted the coming of the Tea Party. He had a film in the 60s called Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, that's them again. There they come out of the ground. <laughs> but that's, uh, and the, the irony about that is a lot of those people are struggling against their own interests. They are. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're struggling against their own interests. I mean, you know, I mean. Keep your hands off my Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> but don't touch my Social Security. That's too no much. No federal program. But that's, that's, that's where we are now. We're in a rock, rock and a hard place. I mean, I wrote essays during the campaign about the Weimar Republic, the dangers of Weimar, uh, where the left splits up into pieces, see, and permits the right to grow. And that's what happened in Germany, you know, while, while the left was fighting whether they were communists or socialists or, you know, workers, syndicalists, uh, Hitler was building right. that, you know, and so you looked up and suddenly, they had blown up the Reichstag, you know, which reminded me of 911. Yeah. And uh, the next thing you know, they had banned the left from uh, the Bundestag, from the from the whole uh, parliamentary right. thing, and uh, began to take hostages. You know, Jews, gypsies, you know, whoever was opposed to that kind of fascism. But I don't see the difference between the media, big media, Murdoch media, you know, Fox. It's not that much different from what the, what the Nazi media was. Everything to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right. I mean, when you see people like, what's his name, the guy that they just, Beck, for instance, I mean, uh, or, uh, the rest of these guys, the, the, the right-wing yeah. group that they have. That's very scary because they don't represent anything but fascism. Right. No. Right. You called for, um, on several occasions, the um, formation of a representative assembly, a united front uh, to organize um, black politics. Um, how do you see that? Um, happening uh, today. Today, um, there is nothing close to the kind of, of assembly that we put together with the National Black Political Assembly. Um, how do you see that evolving? Well, it's going to have to happen again. See, first of all, the only way we can go forward is that in this country is that, that coalition, that united front that elected Obama, they're going to have to continue, you know, the blacks, the Latins, the Asians, and the, you know, the progressive whites and that. They're going to have to maintain that motion, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. anything else, if that fragments, then we're going backwards. And that's the danger of, that's the danger of, of, of Obama acting so, uh, backwards in right. terms, because what he's doing is cutting off his own uh, 
backers from him. You know, a lot of people now, man, you know, I was actually giving money to, to, to the campaign, but you know, I can't give money to somebody who's no bomb Africa. You know? I mean, uh, you know, no, it's, 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 it's just, and to join with Great Britain and France, they just got kicked out of Africa last week. You know, that's, that's the last of the straight out colonial powers. And they back at it, you know. I mean, you could never back uh, Great Britain and France against Africa, you know, mm -hmm. or any other powerless people, because that's what they do. That's what they do. They are uh, blood suckers to the bone. That's why, you know, when you see these movies about vampires and stuff, why it's so popular, because they're talking about themselves, you know, they're talking about the nature of this economy, the nature of this society is to suck blood on defenseless people, you know. That's but what rather than building a united front, many of the um, uh, critics of Obama, especially so-called left critics, that um, they don't do anything in, as an alternative to the criticism. They exempt themselves from organizing people and they think it's sufficient to stand on the sidelines and criticize. That's How what they that. Well, it's like, what's his name? Cornell West, Cornell. He's gonna criticize, call uh, 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 Obama a white man in black skin. You right. know? Well, this is a guy that taught at uh, Harvard and Princeton. I don't know no black people teach at Harvard and Princeton. If you get in one of them, you're lucky. <laughs> but I just wonder, you know, uh, I, was, I, was at a, I was at a, a conference, a socialist conference, and these people were making all these ridiculous statements. I said, I want to know, I said, I'm a communist. I want to know where are the socialists in this group? Where are the communists in this group? And Cornell says, I'm a Christian. <laughs> so after that, I said, well, yeah, okay, that's cool. But then I reminded him, you know why they killed Christ, don't you? <laughs> Running the money lenders out the temple is not health. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the problem. A lot of these people feel that the Black Liberation Movement was a means of getting them into an Ivy League college. You know, the, yeah. the idea that it was to try to change the very nature of the United States is lost on them, you know, because they are perfectly comfortable in, in this thing. And uh, that's why if you looked at that book that Marvel wrote about Malcolm, on the back of the book, the three people pushing the book were Cornel West, Skip Gates, and Michael Eric Dyson. You know what I mean? Now, if you want a, a representation of that Buppy Ivy League yeah. mentality, they, there they go, right there, you see. And unfortunately, Marable fell into that kind of uh, fake analysis. Uh, see, what their analysis is, is that the left, in quotes, the Democratic Socialists, even the CP today, uh, the Trotskyists, are more progressive than, I said, no, 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 the Black Liberation Movement had the most powerful effect on America. Not the CP, not the Democratic right. Socialists, right. not the Trotskyites, but even Elijah Muhammad, as backward as you might think they were, and Malcolm and all these black liberation groups, the Panthers, they're the ones that, that uh, brought in Obama. It wasn't your, right. you right. see. But if you don't understand that, if you're going to belittle them because they're not formally socialist, then you don't even know, you don't even read Lenin. Because mm -hmm. if you read Lenin, Lenin said, we don't measure the struggle against imperialism by their formal commitment to democracy, but by the effect they have right. in beating imperialism. And if, so if you, don't, if you haven't read Lenin, don't talk to me about the left. You know what I mean? So that's, that's the problem. You have people who masquerade under some form of social democracy, pretending they're on the left, but really just dribbling the ball inside regular capitalist yeah. American philosophy. Right. 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 When you look back at all of the contributions that you have made as a, a writer, a playwright, um, music critic, cultural critic, 
Um, when you look back, how do you see the peaks and valleys of your own contribution? What? Well, it, you know, you have to... Uh, I just wrote a play about Du Bois called The Most Dangerous Man in America. That's what the FBI called him. The most dangerous man in America. The man is 82 years old, he's got a cane. It's, and then he, he explains what they have done to him, you know, mm -hmm. when they indicted him as an agent of a foreign power for talking about peace, yeah. for condemning the hydrogen atom bomb. You understand? They, can, they, they indicted him as an agent of a foreign power at 82 years old, you know. And he explained that, that once that happened, uh, the publishers that sought his writing no longer did that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, he was never, ne then they began to stop his speaking engagements. He said, I, who was a man that every Negro in the United States wanted, one time became, you know, uh, a pariah. You see? So I could understand that. I could see that. So yeah, that's what they will do. If you do something that the that the powers that be don't like, mm -hmm. they make you invisible. So even though Du Bois won that case, and that was the first case against McCarthyism, his case, he won that. He had uh, Vito Mark Antonio as his attorney, the last communist in in the Congress. But even though he won that case. At the end, he said, now the little children will no longer see my name. Mm -hmm. And that was accurate. And that's what they do to you. You know, I mean, you can write what you want to and say what you think needs to be said, but in the end, they'll pay you back. Have they done that to you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, just, just money-wise, last year, I, I lost $16,000 in terms of, you know, speaking and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's clear. Uh, then some of the places we went, like we went to Princeton and, and they said, well, this is going to be hard for us to have you at Princeton because that we have to spend an extra $10,000 for security. <laughs> like people that come up and shoot me. <laughs> you know? But uh, it's a normal thing, man. You have to, I mean, it's normal. It's not normal. It's abnormal. But it's normal if you understand what you are doing and who the people you are opposing. Right. People are always running after me. Uh, don't you ever play? Didn't you ever play on Broadway? Why should I have a play on Broadway? I mean, you think that people want somebody to come up and say, you need to die. And then put, let's put this play on Broadway. <laughs> you need to die. No, they're not going to do that. So yeah. it's a choice. You have to make that choice. That's all. You make that choice and you have to live with it. You know. Otherwise, what are the things that you're working on? What projects are you working on now? Well, I played it uh, on Du Bois. I just finished that two weeks ago, and uh, that took up my time for the last few months. Uh, but, you know, I've got, uh, there's a book called uh, Revolutionary Art for Cultural Revolution, Razor, that I've been waiting for for two years from uh, Third World Press. I don't know what he's doing. He sent me two sets of proof. I marked both of them. Still no book. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know we're doing things. We have a project in Newark called Lincoln Park Coast uh, Cultural District. That's an old district in Newark where the abolitionists lived and used to preach against slavery. Mm -hmm. And right next to that was the music, you know, the black music uh, center. So we we've sort of annexed that area. We're building houses down there, and uh, for the last five years, we've had a big uh, music festival. As a matter of fact, it's coming up again in the next month, uh, and we're organizing a tribute to James Moody, mm -hmm. you know, who's a mm -hmm. Newark a musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, t tomorrow, uh, we're having a celebration for Juneteenth, mm -hmm. you know, the the day when word that slavery was over reached Texas, mm -hmm. which is three years later. <laughs> three years yes. later. So we have a that tomorrow, which should be 
interesting and important. But that's, uh, we just try to do things now to support, uh, you know, Raz and his struggle because as it would turn out, he's the most progressive person on the city council, so he's always involved in struggling against these backward forces. Because, you know, politics, as you well know, for some people is nothing but a gig. Right. It's not about advancing anything or consciousness. So that's we have to. Well, we have the opportunity, perhaps, to um, raise money for Roz for um, mayor of Newark. People keep asking me that. <laughs> So we you, wait. We gotta wait. You gotta wait. We gotta wait. We gotta wait. No, no, don't worry about it. But uh, his day will come. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. It's just something that is obvious to everybody, but we just have to wait till it matures. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. You don't want to go out too soon because remember when when Raz got out of college, he ran for mayor. Right. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> Right away. Right away. He was out of college three months. <laughs> so you've got to give it time, you know. But he's only forty-one. He's got. He's got. Uh, he's got a long time. And he's he's got an increasing political base that he's building. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what has to happen. No, when we when we when he does that, we will definitely be ready. You yeah. Know, it's not. <laughs> well, it's not an if. <laughs> It's right. a win. It's a win. <laughs> well, Pittsburgh is always glad to have you back. Thank you very much.